Thank you, Elena and Yvonne. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to see you, Phil. Uh, let me just introduce myself real quick. I'm Seth Chazelle. I was at the New York Times for about 15 years, writing about video games for about half of that. Took a little dot-com adventure, and now I'm back to writing about the business of interactive entertainment, uh, both for the New York Times and also for a publication called Protocol. Uh, now, Phil, I think we first met about 15 years ago at the Amsterdam 2005 pre-Xbox 360 launch event. And uh, obviously, Phil is one of the titans of the industry. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Seth, and uh, good job introducing you, though. I think most of us in the industry know you well, um, and uh, it's it's great to have you kind of back uh, and writing and, and talking about what's going on here. Yeah. 15 years ago, I think we're dating, dating ourselves, my friend. Um, it's, it's been a good run, fun, fun time in the industry, a lot going on right now. So I'm excited to get to talk to you about it. And you've been at Microsoft now for quite a long time, I guess about 30 years. And before we talk about, I'm not going to embarrass you, uh, Ben, before, we want to talk about the future, obviously, and a lot of what's coming down the pike. Uh, but before we do that, uh, maybe it's best to level set and uh, get your understanding of where we think we are now. Console generations are always a milestone to reflect on gaming's past and the future. Uh, how do you think this current console generation should be remembered? It's a good question. You know, I think about, as you said, the generational transitions always are a good time for us as an industry, frankly, to reflect as a platform to reflect. When I think about this past generation, I think what I'd say is this is a generation where we really saw the power or who's in control move from the device to the player. Uh, players are so much, they're in so much control of the experience now from where they play, what they play, where they buy. Um, you know, we're seeing the kind of demise of the walled gardens where it was a device led kind of approach to a player led approach in so many ways. And uh, I just, I think that's a strong thing for the industry and its growth. Uh, and it's definitely this last generation was a real inflection point in that strategy and that approach, I think. And what's one of the things that you've learned uh, during this generation that you might not have fully understood uh, when we began? Yeah, I mean, for me, and, and you know this, like I, I came into this role during the generation right after the launch. And the, the thing that will stick with me, hopefully, for frankly, the rest of my career is just the role that the players play in the direction that we take. Now, early on, we started a user voice kind of approach, getting feedback from our players about things they wanted to see in the platform. And really, as, as the leadership team at Gaming and Microsoft, uh, we, we try to put the player at the center of every decision that we make. What is the player? What would the player want? What would our customer want? Um, and try to build the solutions, whether it's back back compat, smart delivery, the consoles that we're focused on, the games we're delivering and where they're available, what would the player want? And that, uh, it, I think it's led us to some really good decisions this generation, and it's something that will, like I said, stick with me um, for many years to come. Now, looking forward, you picked a heck of a year to launch a new Xbox. <laughs> yeah, you know, the... This planning starts years ahead. Uh, I think Jason Ronald and I were talking about it. It's been like four years we've been planning for this launch and you've got a target date. And um, I don't know that we could have predicted that 2020 would be the year that it is. Um, you know, it's first, I just have to say for, you know, the, the hardships that this year has had for so many across so many different fronts, frankly, in society um, that, you know, our, our, as a team, our, our hearts and our thoughts go out to just the situations that so many people are dealing with. And, um, and I, I think we, we can never lose sight of the fact that gaming is a discretionary activity, something that's there for fun and entertainment. We're not frontline workers. We're, um, you know, we're, we're building video games and video game consoles. That said, it's been really cool to see how the role our industry has played during the C-19 specifically was stay at home, work at home, uh, school from home. We've seen a big swell in usage on the platforms. We've seen gaming connect more and more people. We've had you know, hundreds of millions of new friend connections that get created on the platform across so many different countries. 
Um, it's just you know, gaming, I've always believed, is a real way for people to connect across social, economic, racial, uh, religious divides. It brings people together. And, and I see this right now um, just happening at mass uh, during this time. And it, it is a reflection of what gaming can mean. What's been the impact of the pandemic on, internally, and not only on the development side, getting the new console out? Uh, what's been the impact for you? Yeah, you know, I always start this when I, I just think about the safety, security of, of our teams and our partners and the people who are uh, working on our products. You know, we're, we're all working from home. Uh, we've been we've learned what that means. Um, and just to ensure that the decisions we're making as a team are really putting that safety and security at the forefront is, is important to us. Um, when I, I think about the, the hardware side of it, which is probably the most unique thing this year for us, um, I've been really encouraged. In fact, I had a, a long review yesterday um, on how the progress that we're making on the on the hardware platform and it's going really well. Uh, we're, we got the units at home. Um, I feel good about our supply chain work and our silicon work. All of that's really come together. Um, in a good way, and the teams have worked in some really creative ways to keep making progress. On platform and games specifically, uh, you would think that that you know, could maybe be more virtualized, a little easier than hardware, but there are definitely functions that happen on the creative side of game development that are easier when people come together. I've been really impressed with some of the, the, the kind of innovative ways that our teams have used tech to help, I was just watching as one of our internal teams um, was using xCloud and they were actually deploying test builds into our cloud servers. And then they were as a team all able to go and play basically the new build almost instantly. So people aren't having to download the new build. They're just, they're playing uh, from the xCloud kind of a private xCloud servers. These are things that we're talking to first party teams and third party teams about teams coming up with real unique ways to connect during that creative process, but uh, you know, when you need to get everybody together in a room, whether you're doing mocap or symphonic or whatever your work that you're doing, that's definitely uh, you know stuff that we're having to work around, and it is having an impact. There's no doubt. I want to come back to XCloud in a little bit because uh, there's a lot to talk about with cloud in general. But you mentioned your first party uh, software development, uh, the game development, and I definitely want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, in fairness, uh, your main console competitor, Sony, is often considered by some players to have a stronger first-party lineup than Microsoft has had historically. But I know you've now made a huge investment in that area. I think you're up to, what, 15 Xbox game studios now? Yeah, you know, the, the first-party content is really important to where we're, we're going. It's important to our hardware platforms, important to things like Game Pass, um, and our overall gaming strategy at Microsoft. And uh, as we got in place, the new leadership team a few years ago, and we started building our strategy and articulating our strategy internally to the company, it was really encouraging to see the support that we were getting from the board and the senior leadership team at the company to go and grow our first party. And I feel really good uh, about the lineup of creator-led studios that we have now all under uh, Matt Booty's leadership. And I'm seeing the output of those teams. Some of the things have been announced. Many of them have not. Uh, I'm seeing how the community of creators inside of our own teams are coming together to have an impact on each other and the work that they're doing and learning from each other as studios, but also on our service and our platform work, that feedback loop that you get from creators um, as you're building out uh, your, your software and your hardware platforms is very, very critical. And uh, we know it, we know it's important. We know it's something that our fans want. But I will also say that we're going to create our first party um, around the things that we feel like we need to do in order to stand up for Xbox. And sometimes we, we get suggestions of where's your X game or where's your Y game when people look at the other hardware platforms. You know, I don't think our goal is to replicate what other people have done. Um, it doesn't help the industry to have people that are trying to do exactly the same thing uh, with our platform services or content. I'm really proud of the diversity of content that our Xbox Game Studios teams are creating of genres and art styles and platforms and gameplay, single player, multiplayer, cooperative work that's coming along. Just really proud of 
of the diversity that I'm seeing uh, from the from the Xbox Game Studios organization. And I think that's going to continue. That'll be a mainstay for us, that it won't be about, about a certain kind of genre, or a certain kind of story, that the teams are really led by their own vision and what they want to build. And I think we've talked a few times about how the technology really just exists to allow creative people to create more immersive experiences. That's what this is really all about. Uh, and when we talk about the mix uh, of products coming out of Xbox Game Studios, are there certain kinds of experiences that you might not have been able to deliver on the previous generation that you're now enabled that you can then lean into to highlight the power and the opportunities uh, of the new Xbox? This is always a, a difficult kind of question because I, I know people are looking for the one, two, or three tech that only shows up on a certain platform or is only made possible in a, um, on a certain platform. And I think it's it's just a matter of, of degrees, and it has been for a while. You know, we can go back in console history and see things like 2D to 3D, which were dramatic kind of inflections in the creative canvas that creators were using. Uh, I think we're at a point now with immersion, um, with the tools that we have and the compute capability, uh, that the deltas will be smaller from a visual impact or a feature X was never possible before and now it is. That might sound depressing to some. What I will say is on the advantage side of what I'm seeing now is really the immersive nature of the content that's get, getting created. The things that would break the immersion that you had in a story, whether it's, it's loading or whether it's frame rate jitter, um, whether it's the frame rate that the game was running at, you know, we're able to get to, in certain instances, almost lifelike graphics today, um, even on current gen in certain instances. But when you take that and you mix it with very high frame rate, solid frame rate, um, very little latency in input, uh, and 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 the ability for game storytellers to really push the emotion in the story that they're trying to get through their game, kind of through the screen, through the controller, in the U, uh, that is something that I'm feeling in the games now that's a dramatic step up. Um, and it, I don't know that it's a, it goes from X to Y in terms of a feature capability, but definitely in terms of a feeling of immersion in the content that's being created right now, I think we're going to come to a, a really great future where stories will even have more feeling um, and impact. Now, just to wrap up on the first party software side, obviously Halo is your crown jewel IP, uh, and we're all looking forward to playing the new Halo. Uh, but just for you personally, is there a particular first party game you're most looking forward to playing on the new system uh, or with the new set of services you're offering that's beyond Halo? <laughs> and that's kind of an unfair question. Um, is there? I'm going to pick a couple, uh, just two, just two um, among all the games that I'm, I'm looking forward to playing. Uh, one of them, you know, is uh, I, I tweeted about this. I had finished Gears Tactics. I'm a turn-based strategy guy from way back in the day playing Civ and, and stuff. And I had a really good time playing Tactics on PC. And I finished um, in normal mode. And I'm looking forward to playing that game um, on Xbox Series X, and I'll probably bump the difficulty and, and, and play through the game again. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I will say a game that is uh, just every time I see it is so stunning is uh, Flight Sim. And for us at Xbox and Microsoft Gaming, you know, Flight Sim has a long history inside the company. Uh, but the studio at Asobo is doing amazing work on that. It's such a technology just powerhouse that game with what it's using in terms of cloud compute to deliver the experiences that they have. And I think that game um, on Series X is going to be just be jaw dropping. And um, I can't I can't wait to experience that on the on the next. And I actually haven't played that one yet um, on on the uh, with even stuff. I'll be going in fresh, which will be fun. Well, yeah, it's been almost 15 years, uh, I guess, since we've had a new uh, flight. So I think a lot of us are looking forward to that. And that's actually a great uh, title for you to bring up as we transition from talking a little bit about the content to some of the business models. Uh, and I talk about Game Pass and subscriptions. And is there a situation where a game like Flight perhaps is enabled by the subscription model uh, from a distribution and marketing and business model standpoint where in a way that's different than a retail model as we dive into talking about Game Pass? You know, game, we've talked about it for a while now that Game Pass 
will become an enabler of, of a variety of content that maybe in a pure retail only model might struggle to find an audience or the audience that it needs to kind of recoup the development costs of the game. Um, and we're already seeing it. Like it's, we've kind of, we're past now the threshold with the number of subscribers that are on the platform. And frankly, I, I confuse people sometimes when I say this, I start to think about Game Pass as almost a platform unto itself where games can really be published into Game Pass, find an audience of, you know, well over 10 million subscribers at this point who for kind of very little friction can go try a new game. Maybe they, they like the idea, they like the box shot, it's from a studio that they know. And that kind of marginal cost of trying the next game today is just the download. And as we've talked about with xCloud, even, even that will be going away soon, um, where I can really just go try in new things. And we're, we see it today, you know, it's, it, Game Pass definitely enables creators to find audience that they might not have found through a pure retail model. Um, it doesn't preclude the retail model. Everything that's in Game Pass today is for sale. Um, and so we're not trying to, we're not trying to move the business model from X to Y. We're trying to create choice uh, for customers and creators. And we see it. There's so many games today that are finding millions of players that probably would not have found those pl those players through a pure retail model. And I just think that opens up the canvas of creativity for creators everywhere. And I think that's a good thing for us as players and as the industry. And let's broaden out to the industry, as you mentioned, because if you look at other media industries, entertainment industries, whether it's music uh, or movies and film, we've obviously seen a big shift from a retail a la carte model to a subscription model. Uh, in general, though, not everyone in the industry is on board. Uh, with subscriptions. So where do you think the industry is generally? Uh, and, you know, why are other companies, or not other companies, but why do you think Microsoft has taken the lead uh, in this area? You know, I think change and and large change is, is always one of the hardest things in, in an industry. And you, usually what you see, and you've seen it in the, in the other media, where it's not the incumbents that create uh, the the kind of bigger opportunities, it's others coming in. Uh, for us, it was about if, if somebody's going to go and innovate and create a new model for delivering content and, and consuming content, finding your next favorite game, we wanted it to be us. We didn't want uh, somebody new to come in that didn't have the, the kind of history that we have in the industry. We felt like there was a unique opportunity for us there, but it's, it is difficult. You know, you can go back, it's the innovator's dilemma to some extent. If you offer things in a subscription, does that negatively impact what you sell at retail? Um, does it, how does it, how does it impact kind of other business models that you might be thinking about um, as a, as a company? So for us, yeah, we, we were kind of a bit of, uh, I guess, economic anarchists as we went forward and we said, let's not get constrained by the models that have existed previously. Let's build models around players. Uh, and if those models actually create challenges to the existing model, let's work hand in hand with our partners. And I've been really you know, pleased with the amount of support that we've had from third parties and independent studios in, in Game Pass and continue to see that. It's been really great. Uh, and I think now we're starting to see the opportunity for those partners and it's actually becoming easier for us to secure content for Game Pass because the studios and the publishers see it, right? They see that when the, a game enters Game Pass, um, it finds players that they wouldn't have had, they wouldn't have found before. And the long-term value of the content that they're building goes up the more players become, you know, fall in love with the stories and the characters. And I suspect that you can't really go into a lot of details about this, but can we go a little bit farther and talk about like the financial incentives and why going on to Game Pass makes sense for developers and publishers and just a little bit about how that looks for them? Yeah, you know, the I think today we've matured as an industry quite a bit um, and just in terms of how we manage IP and franchises. Um, you know, you, you had older models where it was in certain models still work in this place, but it was all about every year, the new thing has to come out and a retail, it was almost, you're trying to create a subscription out of retail to just get the same customer to come in every September, October and, and buy your game again. Um, and there was, there was 
franchise management you had to do with that, but there was also just a lot of heavy lifting you were doing as a creator to migrate the existing player that was already playing your game, loving it. In many ways, your biggest competitor was your last game. And you've seen teams move from that. Not every team moves, uh, feels the need to go and and kind of build uh, N plus one version of the game. You know, I watched the, the my friends of Bungie and their Destiny stream uh, a couple weeks ago, which I thought was awesome. And they really showed a long roadmap for Destiny 2. And I think that's a great example of a team that's thinking about the community that they have and how they grow that community. And their only model for continuing is not to come out with a, the, the third version, but rather continue supporting of the game that millions and millions of people love, including myself. So I think as teams have grown into managing engagement, uh, managing community, managing the social around their games, models like Game Pass can really work. I mean, it's as teams have even looked at things like free to play is not that different of how do I go create a large top of funnel for my games coming in and, and Game Pass in many ways works like a large top of funnel for many games. And I think people know that if you can get millions of people to love your game, play your game, uh, the longevity of that game is longer than it's almost ever been. And your ability to continue to grow uh, the business that you're building as a studio goes up with the more players that you have. One aspect of Game Pass, which I've really enjoyed, and people who know me, I, I love console experience. I love being on the couch with my friends uh, doing that. But my, my personal uh, preference is playing on PC. Uh, and the ability to leverage Game Pass across both the PC and the console ecosystem, that obviously has to be a big differentiator and advantage for you, both financially and in dealing with publishers. You know, the model that we started on, and it's been years now, and the, the puzzle pieces slowly come together, uh, we announced we were going to ship our first party games on both PC and Xbox. And that was a view of at some point, we want to be able to bring these communities closer together. Um, the back compat work that we did was about, okay, we wanted to make sure, regardless of what generation you fell in love with the game, we wanted to give you the absolute best version of the game you can play, which is, as you know, as a PC player, something that PCs had um, from almost the beginning with Win32 compatibility and how all of that works. So, um, you know, as we've been building the pieces together and, and kind of getting to where we are now on the cusp of, you know, xCloud and allowing people to play games come anywhere, um, I think you're absolutely right that that capability that we have on PC and that we've embraced gamers wherever they are, but including on, on PC and we're shipping our first party games there, we're building Xbox Live communities there. We have a Game Pass community that's million strong on PC now, which is just awesome to see. And as as creators, and it was kind of goes back to your other question about the kind of what has happened this generation, if you start to think about the player as your customer and not the device through like the player through the device, you want to allow your your the players of your games to just play the game wherever they want to go play. And for you who likes to play on PC, you should be able to play that game on PC, stop and then go pick up um, on console and continue where you are with your same friends. And if eventually you're, you're playing on a phone somewhere, same thing. I want to basically be able to stop, use quick resume and pop back in wherever I go and, and continue to play. And um, that's our goal. And uh, embracing anywhere you want to play is, is just kind of fundamental to, to what we're trying to build. And to be clear, I am not anti-console. Uh, I love consoles. <laughs> but we've, we've talked about xCloud a couple we talked about xCloud a couple of times. We haven't really uh, dove into that. So let's talk a little bit more about your work with xCloud and game streaming. Uh, a lot of different trials. Uh, not a lot of visibility yet for us in the public about what the plans are with xCloud going forward. Uh, we've seen some uh, different streaming plays come from folks like uh, from Google and Amazon's working on some things and NVIDIA. So where are we at with xCloud and what should we expect to see over the next little bit? Yeah, you know, we, we launched our preview, was it October of last year? So still less than a year. Uh, we've had hundreds of thousands of people come in and help us preview and learn, which has been important to us. The other thing that's been happening on the back, which you know our, our customers don't necessarily see, is our creators are learning. Creators are really interested in what kind of games do people want to play in a streaming environment? How do they play? Is session length different? 
Where are the areas where people drop out? Like all of this, it's new, right? It's a new canvas for us as creators of people playing games that were originally meant for one device, now ending up on multiple devices. So I just wanted to thank both all the creators that have been along this journey with us, um, as well as all the players that have helped. You know, as you said, we're going to bring uh, xCloud into Game Pass. Uh, we've, we've talked about that. It's a natural way to extend where you can play your Game Pass library um, is to add the ability to stream to, to mobile devices to go do that. We'll be talking more about that pretty soon. It's actually not too far off now um, where we'll give more clarity on both the kind of the business model, which I think people really like, um, as well as the library of games to go play and where you can go play that. So we're close. We feel good about the tech. We feel like we've learned a ton. Um, we're still busy putting hundreds of thousands of more uh, blades in Azure data centers around the planet um, to enable us to have a pretty broad launch when this goes out. Um, and I think it'll have an impact in a lot of places, some expected and, and likely some unexpected. And just one more on, on xCloud, just from a technical perspective, I think a lot of people were skeptical about the idea of cloud gaming in the first place. Uh, the first main consumer application came from a different company. Uh, but I think over time, the market in general has become a lot more comfortable. Just over the last six, nine months, we've seen that in general, cloud can work. Uh, and I'm sure that Microsoft has its own uh, way to uh, make it even better. Just in general, though, I mean, should gamers really be thinking about streaming as a way to really get that full experience? Yeah, you know, this is one of the areas where maybe we differ from some of the language out there. I, I've never tried to position xCloud as a replacement for your gaming PC or for a console. Um, I think it augments the experience that I have. Now, for me, like you were talking about, I like to go sit down in front of the big screen and, and play on a console, play on my Xbox. I'm sitting here at my PC rig right now and I like to play here, but I'm not always in front of those two devices. And I want to be able to go play where I want to go play. Um, on the device that I choose. So, you know, I don't think the the best, the highest fidelity place to go play a game um, is gonna be streamed from an Azure data center, or anybody's data center anytime soon. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not a viable place to go play and it's not an option that you should take. So, you know, I, I, we're building this, this hardware, we're building this capability. So to enable you to go play the games that you wanna go play, but not as a replacement to where you go play them today. Uh, and I, I think that's just a fundamental difference. It's part of the overall ecosystem uh, for you. It is, yeah. You know, we think about an Xbox gamer as somebody who can play their Xbox games with their Xbox community on many devices. And we want to make sure you have the best experience on the device that you're playing on, which is kind of our, our smart delivery technology, that the device that you're on, you should have the bits that show up the best on that device. And different devices have different capabilities. There's no doubt about that. The nice thing about me playing on my Android phone when I'm sitting you know, in, in a waiting room somewhere is I can do it and I can't do that with my console there. So it has unique advantages, but I wouldn't say the unique advantage is, is fidelity um, you know, or even responsiveness. There is latency, the speed of light still exists. Um, and the electrons actually have to go over the internet. So uh, there are there there are definitely going to be kind of there'll be things about cloud streaming that don't match exactly what you do on PC and console, but there are advantages that it has. And I just want you to feel like you're connected to Xbox wherever you decide to play. Now, when we talk about streaming, uh, one of the aspects of that is it sort of transitions to a discussion of how the overall game industry has changed in the sense of you have new competitors. Uh, and new kinds of companies coming into this industry. And I did a piece uh, in February, uh, and you said something pretty interesting. And I want to give you a chance to clarify and amplify your remarks. Now, this was a story, it's got to be clear, uh, this is for a publication called Protocol. It was not about the gaming incumbents. It was not about Sony. It was not about Nintendo. Uh, it wasn't really about even Microsoft. It was about how big tech companies like Amazon uh, and Google uh, and Facebook uh, are getting into this market a little bit more. Uh, and I, I got to quote you. Uh, what you said was, um, when you talk about Nintendo and Sony, we have a ton of respect for them, but we see Amazon and Google as the main competitors going forward. That's not to disrespect Nintendo and Sony, but the traditional gaming companies are somewhat out of position. I guess they could try to recreate Azure, 
but we've invested tens of billions of dollars in cloud over the years. Now, I know you weren't trying to diss Nintendo and Sony, but the market has changed and there are different aspects that come into delivering a next generation entertainment experience. So can you just talk a little bit about uh, how the changing landscape uh, competitively? Yeah, yeah. I I seem to remember the ripples that were created from that. You and I made some noise on that one. Um, you know, the here's where I'm going to start on that one. I'll say I have a ton of respect for the companies that have helped build the gaming industry that I love. Um, it's been an incredibly important part of my life, my entertainment as a kid, my experiences with my daughters as they've been growing up. Um, and frankly, you know, my my professional career has, has mainly been about, about this industry. So I, when I think about the companies that have been part of creating what the industry is today, I always struggle to say that my strategy, our strategy at Microsoft is to eliminate those companies or to somehow, you know, create a world where they can't thrive. Um, I've said it before that having a strong Sony, having a strong Nintendo, you know, PlayStation and, and Nintendo, they matter in games industry. And we're not building a strategy that's trying to preclude those companies from having success. And I know that's hard for some to hear and they hear it and they think it's um, I'm lying somehow, but uh, we ship games there as those companies are looking for potential cloud partners. We're more than happy to try to help because I, I think it's an, an important thing for us as an industry that we respect um, our history and how we got here together. Co competing in many areas, yes, and we do compete with Sony and Nintendo in many areas, but also recognizing that this industry is growing incredibly quickly right now and it has more global influence than it's ever had. And there's real opportunity for us to take a player-centered approach and not a device-centered approach as an industry. And those things can help the industry grow and have more impact. Um, when I think about our other large tech competitors as Microsoft, and I, I sit on the senior leadership team at Microsoft and I see all the conversations and the competition that's having with those, with that Microsoft has with those companies, you know, those for me are not companies that are are native to the game industry. Um, and I just wanna make sure that as this industry evolves, as the business models evolve, and as we're trying to innovate in new ways and we're creating new social structures in our industry and we're meeting new players, um, that the history of what we've learned in getting here over the decades matters in terms of how we navigate forward. So um, I guess my, my comments are just more about um, respect for how we got here as an industry and the, the progress that we've made and looking at, at other players who have, don't have a history in this business trying, coming in um, and just wanting to sure as an industry, we, we, we protect what we have and we grow it in a thoughtful way. Now, you've talked about uh, the future of gaming is built on the pillar of three C's, right? Community, uh, cloud, content. Content, I've... community, and cloud. Yeah. Right, right. Content, community, and cloud, okay. And you obviously would think that you're well positioned in all three of those pillars, content, community, cloud. And then, but obviously as we talk about whether it's the Nintendos and Sonys on the one hand or the Amazons and Googles on the other, different kinds of strength on those different pillars, right? In terms of how you position yourself vis-a-vis uh, -vis them, correct? Yeah, yeah, we, so when we were building our, our kind of evolving our strategy as a leadership team for where we're trying to go, we actually tried to erase us and any other specific company and just say, what do we think a gaming platform that's going to succeed over the decade, next decade needs to have as core competencies and capabilities? And that's where we came up with the three C's of content, community and cloud. Um, you know, and then it led to us doing some things like as, as we've talked about, really investing in our content, our first party content. Because as we looked, we said, that's an area we could actually, we need to do more. And, and we, we've done that. In our community, making sure we're bringing Xbox Live to every endpoint that somebody wants to play on, whether it's our own device or someone else's device, we want you to be able to stay connected to your community wherever you go. And cloud's probably the hardest one for a lot of the kind of incumbent game companies to compete on, just because it's such a capital investment to go create uh, what, a few companies on the really, you know, Amazon and Microsoft have created on the planet of a global cloud infrastructure um, that we have. But we built that, the, the kind of modeling of three C's without thinking about our strengths. Um, and I also just, and this is a little bit longer, but 
I also understand that three C's is not what a customer cares about. What a customer, what a player, what I care about is I want to play my games. I want to be able to play them wherever I am. I want to be able to play with you, my friends, wherever I go play. Um, and I just want that to seamlessly work across every device that I see. So the customer benefit is the games that I want to play with my friends wherever I am. The infrastructure that we think you need is great content, a community to stay connected to people across all the devices, and a cloud infrastructure to enable that. And there are yeah, very few companies about, that are positioned for that. That's right. And you talked a lot about putting players at the center of the experience, and that can involve a lot of what you might call rights or policy issues. Uh, whether it's cross-play, whether it's buying a game for one platform and uh, having that future upgrade path. But one thing we haven't talked a lot about that I think a lot of people out there just don't even really know about is a program called Xbox All Access, uh, which is really taking away that several hundred dollar upfront cost and letting people buy uh, not only the hardware, but also subscribe to the software for a monthly fee. Um, I think it's around 20, 25 bucks right now. It's not a you know major program. But you know, once again, when we look at other industries like say cell phones, you know, very few, yeah. at least in this country, people don't think about spending a thousand bucks on a cell phone. They pay for it monthly, whether it's uh, through uh, the device manufacturer themselves or their carrier. And that model is something that you have experimented with. Um, but how much should we see you driving that forward uh, in the next generation here with Xbox All Access, letting people finance and buy the machine and subscribe to the software all for a relatively low monthly price. Yeah, I think X, all Xbox All Access is going to be critical to both our launch uh, for Xbox Series X as well as just the overall kind of generation. We, as you said, many things, frankly, in our program, uh, we test and learn and, and flight as we go. You know, we don't we don't necessarily step function things that we do on the hardware capability um, or even on things like Xbox All Access business models. So um, we want to bring our whole customer base along and we want to offer options and opportunities and learn when we can. So as you said, Xbox All Access this generation has been something that we've, we've trialed, we've, we've put into market in limited uh, kind of capacity in certain areas. It's just a path for us to learn and see if there's signal um, from customers uh, on this. And it's been great, the response that we've seen where we've tested Xbox All Access has been great, but as you said, it's been limited in terms of the market. So you're gonna see a much broader market and retailer support for Xbox All Access. Uh, and as you said, it, it matches a model that customers use uh, for many different, many other devices that they buy. And as you have services that are, uh, you know, attached to those devices that people love, it just becomes a, an easier way uh, to, bring, to, to bring a great product to customers. And we should also, just understand the economic, the global economic situation that we're going to see this year. Um, we're seeing it today. And I think having more pricing options for consumers is frankly just a thoughtful thing for us as industry to think about of how, whether it's Game Pass and me being at, getting access to hundreds of games for uh, a, a lower amount each month or things like Xbox All Access that let me uh, get into a new hardware generation without the big upfront cost. I think those are going to be important things um, with the just kind of the economic situation that we see outside. Sure. Now I have to ask you just straight up about your main competitor uh, in this. Well, not your main competitor, but one of your competitors in the console side in particular, and that's Sony. Obviously, uh, recently we've seen Sony share a lot more detail about their plans, the PS5. Uh, we've seen what it looks like. Uh, they've shared a lot of information just straight up. Um, how do you think you're going to stack up? Uh, what do you think about what they're doing? And how does your plan differ from theirs? Yeah, I watched the show. I thought they did a, a good job. Um, I, I, it was, I sent Jim a note afterwards and congratulated him. I thought, you know, in this environment, uh, trying to pull off a high production value event um, is just not easy. So I applaud the teams at Sony for what they were able to do. You know, as a competitor, it's great to have them out there now. Um, so we, we kind of know what the program is. We see the device, we see the games. Uh, I, just being honest, um, I, I, felt, I felt good after seeing their show. Um, you know, I, I think the, the hardware advantages that we've built um, are gonna show up uh, as we're talking more about our games and frame rates and other things. Um, I thought the games lot, lineup that we're going to have at launch, I felt really good about. 
um, and I, we got more clarity on what they're doing, um, obviously, at their show, which just help us focus in on more of what we have. Um, and I think that'll be a strength for us at launch. So I thought they did a good job. I thought, you know, they, they, do, they do what they do very well. Um, and, and they did that. But when I think about the position that we're in with the games that we're going to be able to show and how they're going to show up uh, and the hardware advantage that we have, um, I, I think we're in a very good position. So I feel good about July and the gameplay that we're going to be showing there um, and the hardware capability. But I'll just say it's also nice as a gamer to see uh, both of us out there and competing. I think the competition uh, leads to better outcomes for for both companies, and and I applaud that. And just to be clear, we will be seeing a little bit more on your side on gameplay and titles and software uh, in July, correct? That's just that's right. Doing. Yeah, we're uh, teams are working hard um, to get it lined up. We'll uh, we've taken feedback from mm -hmm. our last uh, event, uh, and I think people are really going to be uh, pleased with what we're what we're going to be showing there. I think you know. Uh, Halo will be a big part of it, and I think that's an obviously an important title for us. Now, I got a related question. It's a little bit of a red herring, I think, but you, people do focus on what these boxes actually look like uh, in a way that you know, isn't really. I mean, maybe it is relevant to how they perform, um, but it seems like Microsoft has a little bit of a different approach to just design, whether that's the physical design, perhaps acoustic elements. Uh, Sony's been clear <laughs> they want the PS5 to stand out. Uh, just as a machine, uh, and it certainly does that. Um, does Microsoft and Xbox have a slightly different approach to design generally? I mean, I can only talk about the approach that we have. I, I don't know their inner workings, but I'll say for us, you know, we launched the Xbox One originally, and then we had a good sit down with our hardware team about the roadmap that we wanted to create um, and I really wanted to empower the great teams that we have there and give them enough time to see where we're going so that they can absolutely do their best work. Uh, I think I, I, I love the hardware generation that we're coming out of. I think the Xbox One S, the all digital version, we good learning for us um, in, in putting that out. Um, and, and obviously the uh, Xbox One X, which has just performed incredibly well in terms of the performance and the, uh, the, as you talked about, the acoustics. We really set up to be player led in our design. Um, it's not about us. It's not about our device taking center stage. It's about the experience of the games. We want you to hear the games first, not our console. Uh, we want the power inside of the console to be uh, predictable, um, to be high powered so that you're getting an amazing uh, experience um, and to be easy to develop for. So I'd say we are purpose built in the design of our hardware, enabling our teams to go do the great work um, that they can done and that they can do and let the games be center stage uh, for what gameplay is about. And, and frankly, it's a design ethos that doesn't just permeate our, our hardware team. It's really about how we design the services, when we la uh, launch things. I mean, if I if I go back even on the platform and the hardware side, there were things like variable refresh rate that we brought out this generation. We clearly could have held that and not put it out in an Xbox One X and said, no, this is going to be an Xbox Series X exclusive feature. But we knew we could enable it for the customers that we've had that we have today. So we're not we're not trying to kind of artificially hold things back when we know we can deliver to the customers that we have. It's really about continuous innovation and bringing our whole Xbox community along the journey, whether it's games that you fell in love with on the original Xbox that are going to look amazing on Series X, whether it's friends that you've had for 15 years on Xbox Live that you still want to stay connected to. Um, or whether it's hardware features that we think we can deliver to the hardware that you have now um, that we want to be able to deliver if we can. So purpose built, giving the teams time and letting the games be the center of the experience, not the, not the kind of physical design that, that we're putting forward. Sure. Uh, we're getting a little short on time here. Uh, and thank you so much. Uh, this has been really illuminating. Um, we have a couple questions from the audience, uh, and I'll get to a couple of them if I can. Uh, we have one from David Gardner at London Venture Partners uh, who asks, hey, uh, have, 
<laughs> uh, has the democratization of game development impacted the way that games reach consumers on your platforms? And first, if you could just talk about yeah. what democratization of game development means, and then we can talk about how does that change the way that games reach the consumers? I think this has been one of the most, one of the most amazing and, and kind of best growth for us as an industry. And really, in a lot of it, I look back at Steam and things that they enabled with early access and PC has been such a strong part of this. But, you know, for, for those of us that have been around uh, for quite a while, we remember when building a game was not actually the hardest part of, of having success with your game, that there were so many barriers between you actually having an idea and building that to you getting that in front of customers whether it was a retail, a physical retail channel that only had so much self shelf space and publishers had that shelf space locked up. So you had to go do a deal with a publisher in order to get the, the game in front of people, whether it was a, you know, a print magazine review that you were trying to go and get, because that was a great way for you to market uh, the game that you have today, game that you had back in the day today. You know, you and I, we could go grab a couple Unity or Unreal licenses. We could go create a game um, and we could publish that game to PC and console ourselves. Um, so anybody can be a creator in today's world. You can create things in Minecraft and sell to other people. You can create things in Roblox or we could go and use a game engine. And I really think that democratization of the creation process, which allows any creator to reach, frankly, millions of customers, has led to some of the best experiences we've seen recently. It's not lost on me that some of the biggest games that are out there today did not come from the traditional publisher model. You know, things like a Minecraft or a Fortnite or a Roblox. I mean, these are things that came from individual creators going and doing something and having a direct relationship. And I think that's going to continue to evolve to David's question. Uh, as more people creating from more different parts of our planet with new stories and perspectives just helps create gaming as, as a, a really great storytelling uh, mechanism for the planet. I also think you're going to see more and more creation in game. You know, we've had that in Minecraft for quite a long time. You see Epic doing some really cool things with Fortnite in terms of having kind of creator led events inside of their own world. That's to me, another example of just a really freeing up, the creation process to reach millions of customers in new ways. And I, I'm really encouraged by that. And just to dig in a little deeper though, I mean, in fairness, you did just conflate Minecraft and Fortnite uh, and uh, Epic and Notch are not quite in the same situation, let's be fair, but your point's well taken, but it does sort of lead into a follow-up question, which is that, you know, cause the countervailing aspect, I mean, on the one hand, you've got people being able to get a Unity license and to start making products. But the other side is the question is, you know, but did the game production costs go up as the expectations on the part of the users for various high asset, you know, high effort uh, visual aspects uh, increase? Now, Minecraft is a great example and Roblox of what you can do without uh, taxing the last generation. Of course, Minecraft does have ray tracing now, though. Um, That's right. But, so how, but, but this issue of cost uh, and production costs, how does that uh, intersect with this democratization? Yeah, and I think you're still going to have the blockbuster games that big publishers and platforms create that are hundreds of people and hundreds of millions of dollars, those kind of blockbuster events. Um, and as you said, kind of the cost versus return on that has to make sense. Um, and that's something as an industry that does today for big games that reach the audience that they want to go reach. I mean, just look at, you know, GTA 5 continues to sell massive game and it has reached millions and millions of people and at the time, you know, huge budget game. But I also think part of this democratization means I have an ability to grow my game as the community grows because I can constantly update. The only way I'm not stuck in a model where my only way to monetize my game is via a disc or a cartridge at a retail store. And once that transaction happens, that's kind of the end of my relationship as a creator with the customer. So you see many games today that started as one thing and then grew and sometimes even migrated as the creators not only use that democratization to get the game into the market, but also to follow where success has gone. And, you know, I look every day at the top played games on our platform and it's amazing to me how many of those 
are multiple years they've been in the market and frankly are a much different game today than they were when they started. So yes, in aggregate, the production cost has probably grown, but the nice thing is that the creator has been able to grow that as the community's grown. Yeah, you can amortize that over time. Um, this has been an incredibly uh, helpful and interesting conversation. Uh, we're a little, uh, we're gonna wrap up here, but is there anything really vitally important to the overall structure of interactive entertainment that we haven't talked about? Uh, any major themes that we haven't gotten to yet? You know, I'll probably just re re talk about the power of the player. And for all of us that are in the industry or people who are thinking about creating or even you as a player and, and your, your kind of power and control and what you want to experience, um, that we should be player centered as an industry. I, I do believe in the fundamental outcomes are positive when we focus on what customers want and we don't try to manipulate customers for kind of near term financial gain, um, but rather look at the long term investments that we're making as an industry to help them. And we've got areas to grow and learn as Xbox, so I'm not pointing my finger at anybody. Um, but I just say as an industry, I think that's an important point uh, for us because we, we see the strength in that. The thing that I'm, I'm probably most passionate about just as I, I get on in my years in my career is the impact of what being player led means as we reach more players, more creators on more places in the planet. You know, we've seen the, the social strife on the planet right now. Um, uh, and I just, I think building empathy and connection between people, between people who have differences is just such a capability that our industry has, but it's only, it, we can only realize that capability if we empower the creators and the players to be the ones that create the connections that our industry enables. Um, and you know, you've know, you talked about things like cross-play, cross-progression, um, all of those things. Those are just, those should be table stakes for us as an industry and in building ecosystems around what players uh, want from us. And uh, yeah, I just think it's an important thing for us to, to continue to drive for, continue to think about and continue to evolve. Um, as an industry, because I, I do fundamentally believe in the positive impact that gaming can have, and it does have on the planet. And when we talk about the power of games to bring people together across geographies, uh, across backgrounds, um, it's obviously one of the most important parts of this entire industry and what we can deliver to people uh, around the world. Um, thank you so much, uh, Phil, for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Yvonne, and the entire Game Lab team. And I will put the wrap up here now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Phil and Seth. It's been amazing. It's been a real privilege to have you both here, to have this amazing, to be able to share this amazing uh, keynote of Game Lab 2020 in such a special year for Microsoft and for Xbox. We are so looking forward to feeling that power uh, of the new generation, looking forward to see the announcements in July, and hopefully we can have you back one day in Barcelona, one day soon, uh, have you visiting our show here in our city? Uh, plenty of talent that probably will be the, the next generation of creators that will be creating for, for your console, Phil. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. It's good to see Seth again. Um, and uh, I hope the whole show for you is great. Thank you so much. And see you soon. See ya. <laughs>